biggest question me and Paul get asked on a regular basis is how do we how do we um, customize our squirrely birds? And we use pretty pretty similar ways of doing it. But what we've done tonight, we've done it the way I generally do it on mine. So a standard bird, straight out of the box, this is a weighted version, straight out of the box generally sits like that in water, so it sits sometimes a little bit nose down. Now what it's designed to do is on a sweep downwards of the rod tip it's supposed to dive. Now because although it's weighted it doesn't mean it's weighted and it's going to sink, what it best means it's going to, it's going to stay down deeper in the water, so it's going to run deeper in the water column. They do they generally will get off, out of a box, you'll be looking to get maybe five foot out of them, which is not bad if you're going to work on canals and stuff like that, but we, we weight them slightly differently. So the first thing you need to do is very, very important, you've got to check and make sure there's no air holes. So if you check on the hook hangers, make sure there's no little pinholes there because that's very, very important, you don't want water ingress. So what we'll do is we'll either put super glue in those holes or a little piece of a a little piece of epoxy. And what that does, it just makes it airtight and that's very important. The only other place that you can get water in is in the tail. Now, you're not going to take a tail off to just check if it's got an hole on it. So sometimes the best thing to do is put a little bit of super glue around the inside. You pull it to one side and you can actually put a little bit of super glue down there. It'll make it sort of watertight. Now, I've never seen one leak in there, but I've heard people say they do. So that's something to bear in mind. What also we do is we add a split ring to the front. The reason for that is we have noticed that sometimes they'll open uh, when you're casting constantly and you're working them and the way they are because it's quite a violent way of working is that what you'll get, you'll get a small, you'll, you'll get the clasp on the um, on the trace opening up on its own. Now I've probably lost maybe about four or five birds before I realised this and I thought oh, I'll leave in class open when I close them but I never do that, That's, that just doesn't happen. So we have learned this lesson and Paul did a few tests in the previous video and, and definitely you want a split ring on there. Now on, on another one of Paul's videos you'll see that he uses 30 pound split rings. Reason for that is because if you're using really in really snaggy waters, if you want to get your bird back, if you get one really good bird, you want to get it back, use 30 pound split rings and chances are you'll just straighten them out and you'll get your things back. 30 pounds never going to get open by a, pile, by a pike. If you're putting 30 pound of pressure on a pike, it's too much anyway. So it's, it is a clever way of doing it. However, I don't care. I want I want to make sure that everything I hook comes back. If I lose them, I lose them. Nine times out of ten with strong eight pound braid, you'll straighten these hooks. These hooks are not too bad. Now these are the standard bird hook, that's what they come from factory. Now what we, we t tend to do is change them for eagle claws, but they are really good hooks, they're pretty strong, they're quite a thick gauge, but they are, they're fantastic for hooking, they make sure that when they penetrate they do they own properly. So what we've got here, we've got some various examples of what we've done. Tonight we've actually done some weighting and it's, it's, it's amazing how much they've varied. What we did originally, this is, this is what they call, what we class as um, a perfect one. That one sits absolutely perfect in water. Now what I'll do is I'll drop it, I'll drop it in, this, in this test tank here. Now I, what, what I did is I've reweighted this one already. And what happened is um, on its first trip out it had a few fish and it, the tail got bitten off there. So I've changed it for an orange tail. Now the simple thing of changing that tail has unweighted that lure. Now what, is, what in an ideal world what you want them to do is you want them to sit perfectly bolt upright. That's how I like mine to sit. Not a lot of people like that but I, that's how I like mine to sit. And what that does is when you strike, the, strike it down, so it'll sit like that on the surface perfectly and what you want you want this top of this tail to sit just in the viscosity of the water just in the water level just in the surface and one twitch of that rod tip and I mean it can be a little tiny tap will send that down about four foot and what it'll do it'll sink down like that it'll go down and then it'll sit bolt up right and it'll start to slowly slowly come back up and then another twist of the rod tip bang you're down again now what I tend to do is I do two or three really long sweeps of the rod tip, maybe about four or five foot every single sweep, that'll get that deeper and deeper. A good burr, a proper burr, will run about 12 to 15 foot with a good cast, because obviously the further away you cast it, the more sweeps you do, the deeper it's going to go. But I can get these coming at about 12 foot, which is about perfect, it'll, it'll do any river, it'll do most reservoirs, 
what I don't like is sinking ones. If they sink, then I don't tend to get them to work as good and how I like them to work. So this is how we've weighted them. I'll drop this in the water and I'll show you what it should do. So that is just sat with the top of the tail just hanging out of the water. Now what, another thing you've got to be very, very careful of is that you've got to add a trace to the weight of that because that is really, really critical. Now what we've done is we've weighed and it weighed the way about, about three gram, two or three grams. So what we did, we've got some solder. So at the moment, there's just a little top of that tail coming out. So what we'll do, we'll add it to there, the weight of that like so, add it to the bottom muck is quite important as well so it, it's for, for balance and that should just sit perfect now you can see it's actually just hovering above bottom touch down, it goes down leave it, it comes back up that is what we class as a perfect bird now what we do when we add, we're adding small amounts of shot now I use shotgun cartridges but Paul's actually come with some perfect stuff I'm not sure what, where he gets it from but it's almost identical that's it, that's a shot. And it's literally identical what you get out of a shotgun cartridge. Um, it's really dense, it's very, very small. And the reason we use it small is because you want to put as small a hole as possible in the top of here. I think we worked it out earlier, but probably a three mil drill bit. Um, and what that does, it leaves a nice enough hole to be able to put the shot in, but it also nice and easy, so it's a nice smooth finish when you start putting epoxy on top. So that's a perfectly weighted one. That we weighed at 88 grams. If I'm not mistaken, it weighed 88 grams. Every one of these is slightly different to that. So you can't think to yourself, I'm gonna put 20 grams in each one of them, because that doesn't work. What you've got to do is you've got to get to around 87, 88, and then, you, then you, you'll then you either add or take away. So I think we went to about 85 and started adding a little bit in, taking a little bit out. Some of them needed a couple of grams, some of them needed quite a lot. That's the most important thing is you keep on trying it. Now the difference between one sinking and one sitting perfectly can be one single shot. Now you look at those and you think that's impossible but I tell you sometimes you've had to take two out, put one back in and it makes perfect. That's how you want them. So what we've been doing, you've been drilling a hole here. These ones are all ready. So these ones we've prepped already. We've put holes in them all. They all, in theory, with the trace added, should sit perfectly, which there's no point tank testing these because we'll, we'll do it. You'll see on video, I think we've done each individual one. Paul might have got footage of each individual one. All done like that. The last stage of it, basically, is to cover it with a small amount of epoxy. Now, when I say a small amount, you want to make sure you don't put too much on because, again, every single thing you add to that lower makes a difference how it works. If it starts sinking, you've gone too far. If it's a little bit too buoyant, you can just add a little bit of weight to the shank. What me and Paul used to do, we used to add quite a lot of weight. We used to get them somewhere near, and then we'd, we'd wrap it all in the shank. So I'll just put that close so you can see. That's what we used to do. Add all that to it. There's no need, and what, what tends to happen is you're playing fish and you're getting more and more takes. That gets flat and it breaks off, and it starts to change it all. Now what we'll do at the end of the season, we'll start taking them all apart and we'll start redoing them all. All of these are brand new, fresh lures that have never seen water. Apart from that one, that's been out and caught a few fish. All the other ones are all brand new for this season, and me and Paul probably use those quite a lot. Another thing, I'll move these out of the way, we get asked about, is if you've got a standard burr and you want to change it. Now, this is what we would class as a standard burr, a non-squirly burr. That's how they go. That's how they come from factory. Just like that. So it's a solid burr, not a squirly. Now, the, this is a weighted one, and it's actually very, very close to being finished on weight-wise, which is really unusual because other ones are quite a, quite a way away, but this one works perfectly. I think we'll need to add a little bit more. We've already pre-drilled an hole, which I think we worked out. It's about one and a half centimetres from the middle of the hanger, if I'm not mistaken. One, yeah, one, one centimetre from, from centre of the hanger to the middle of the hole. You fill it there, and then you've got a good void inside there to put shot in. If you go too far forward, you'll find that you can't put much shot in there, so you've got to be quite precise. Like I say, what we'll do is we'll probably put, Paul will probably put something on bottom and show you a scale. So what I've done, all I've done is cut this tail off. Again, it's very, very important where you cut it because you are between chambers. And you'll notice this one's actually a weighted one. 
so I've got something inside. The non-weighted ones have nothing inside them, so there's no noise. This has got a really heavy rattle chamber, so you can hear it. Makes a lot of noise. What you need to do, you need to cut it off, and it actually says, if I'm not mistaken, it says a musket mania tackle, and you want to cut it right on the A stroke I of the mania. Cut it straight there. Take that off. That's your spare part. What we've got here, we've got a, a new tail. These are new tails we're getting off at lower factories. Just made a mould uh, at market lower factors. I don't know how much, how much he's going to charge these. He sent me this one as a test. It's actually a little bit longer than a standard tail. If you look, I generally work to three rings. But they, these are new and we'll try them uh, like that. So there's three rings there. So they're a little bit longer than standard. Again, this will make a difference. So if you are replacing one of these tails with an old tail, it will slightly weight your lower differently. So something to be careful of. There's nothing wrong with cutting it down. So I could, in theory, cut that much off because it goes that far inside. I could cut that off, put it inside, and it'll work perfectly. But because it's a fresh one, we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is we're just going to take a little bit of slither this plastic off. We're going to put it inside, make sure it fits nice and snug. Put some blue tack in there, not blue tack, blue tack definitely won't work, especially some of the bike we catch. Um, you want to put some super glue in there, fix it in place, make sure it's all nice and solid, and then what we'll do is we'll weight it up and we'll show you exactly how we do it. Right, so what we're going to do, we're going to take this lure, which is like I say, it's a standard burt before no squirly becomes. This is going to make it into an actual squirly burt. This one worked really well before and it actually dug, dug down probably about six, seven foot, which isn't bad, which isn't bad. Some days, those will work, the ones with the, without a tail will work, but I'm a squirly man, I, like, I do like the squirly birds. So we've cut it off now, what we've done, we've made it all nice and smooth inside as well, so I've tidied it all off, make it all nice and smooth. Now, what a lot of people do ask us as well about tails. Now, out of the factory, nine times out of ten, they'll be perfectly straight, and the seam that runs down the back of the lower will go down the seam with the actual mould, because these are seen like a, a, an injection mould. That'll run perfectly flat down. If it runs off to one side, what that can do, it can make your burt swerve off to one side or other. Now, that it, that can work in your advantage, but I would say don't do that. What I'd do, if it's out if it's out of sync and it's off to one side, I'd take it out and start again. It, you, you'll find it will make a big, big difference. Another thing you can do is if it does veer off to one side like that, you see the hanger like that, what you can do, you can twist that one way or other. So twist it along that way, not twist it like that or like that. I'm going to twist it one way or other. And you'll have to have a play with it and see how it works. But what that can do, it can make it dive down. Now, th some of the best birds I've ever had have not gone down straight. What they've done, they've gone down and veered. I had a pipe pattern one that I lost, I lost about five, six years ago. The what it did, it veered down to the side every single time like that. But I'll tell you what, that lure were taken for one reason, one reason only, because it looked more in distress than a normal bird. When I say in distress, it's what you're trying to replicate with, with a, with a squirrely bird. To me, in my own mind, if you ever see a fish that's poorly, if you ever look in your fish tank and you see a fish that's poorly, what they'll do, they'll flurry down and then they'll start floating. They might not come up perfectly straight, they might come up, up, up like that, but then they'll try and get back down again, and it's generally when the swim blood is starting to go when they're poorly. So I personally think the reason squirrely birds are so effective, A, they've got everything going for them. You've got rattle chambers, you've got colours, you've got a good fishable size, a good eatable size, which I class as like a good bait size. So this is like a, a, ro a good sized roach, maybe a bream size, a perch size, which is a standard fish that pike are going to come across. And when they go down like that and they stay there and they start slowly, slowly raise like that, I think that's the trigger. And, and a lot of times you'll find that they're taken on the slack. So what they'll do is they'll go down and they'll be actually taken as they're like that. Most of it takes and what you'll get, you'll get slack line. You'll pull down your rod and it'll all go slack and you smack them straight away. So what's generally happened, they've grabbed them like that, they've taken taking it away towards you and you feel the slack line. So if you can get them to run perfectly straight, it works great. If they run off to one side slightly, I don't, I, won't, I really won't worry about it. As long as you get to make sure you pick up the slack. The slack line is the most important thing when working anything like this, any pull baits, that you're picking the slack line up constantly. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna have this tail now. Now I'll tell you something as well, um, I'll, I'll add an Andy Scott. He were, he were always favouring putting tails downwards on lures. I don't personally like it. I like, to, I like a tail to go upwards. 
one of the reasons why is that the hooks and sometimes get caught on back of tail, which is not unusual, this sort of thing happens. But if it's above for me, it's a lot less chance of getting fouled with them hooks. It's going to be working backwards like that if it's going up and over back rather than underneath. It might work, you can try it. I've never used it and it's you know I've, I've caught plenty of pike on these. So what we're going to do is we're going to add this now. So what we do, make sure I don't get on wife's table, otherwise I'm hung. It's just standard silk glue. And what we do, we just put a little bit around the inside. You don't want to go silly on this. Again, you're going to start affecting weight if you don't be careful. Even some of the silly soap glue can make a difference. So you put some in there. We put some on the outside. Like so. Don't go silly. Don't need to put loads on. I want to put a drop in here. And there's a bit in the centre there. It's got an only middle bit of that, which makes it really nice for getting it inside. We make sure what's the top, which is that way. What we'll do, we'll start to manipulate it and you just twist it, just twist it into place, just like so. And I'll make sure that fits perfectly in line. I'm just leave that. I'll leave that. That's actually a really nice fit, is that? That seam looks like it runs perfectly down there to me. That's a good. So we'll leave that for maybe two or three minutes. Don't try and pull it out while it's while it's still going off. But I would say that that'll be gone in I don't know another minute or so. That'll probably gone off. So that one for me is ready to go. I'm looking there as well. The bottom seam runs perfectly in line with the seam of there. That one goes in seam with there. Now, like I say, me and Paul were just having having a conversation off camera. What difference is that going to make? Because it's slightly long there. We don't know. We, we honestly don't know because we generally cut them in the same sort of place, which is about three rings down on the actual tail. We'll cut it there. We'll ta start to whittle it away and we'll work it that. Now, what, what sometimes happen, you'll see it'll start making little gaps here. Don't be scared of putting a little bit more super glue on there and just, let, and just letting it all sell. I reckon that'll be perfect in about a couple of minutes. So we got asked a couple of questions regarding birds and, and a few lads asked, asked different stuff. Now, um, noise wise, we, I, I'm a massive advocate for noise. So any lure that makes any, any sort of rattle, any sort of um, as sound chambers in it will definitely definitely attract you more fish now you've got three birds here that are almost identical there's no difference in whatsoever that one I've just done so that one is a pre-weighted bird so that's got already got already got some lead in there but I've also added the my own shot which you've seen and I don't know if you can hear that you can actually hear the rattle of it now that sounds nice it's quite a subtle rattle, but there's definitely noise, and you can hear it when you when you're doing it side of boat. You can actually hear it working. This one is one that Paul's done. He's just added lead. Very little sound, right? Now that that might be that might be slightly larger shot or something like that, or something slightly different inside. Which I think I'm sure, I'm sure Paul has used large, large shot on that. Don't believe that don't work. That caught part of Polo 23 on video, so that's de that definitely works. This one is a weighted one, a complete weighted with no lead inside whatsoever. But you can hear that. That's really loud and clunky. So there's three different lures there, all the same. They all catch fish, and you can see it's up marks on on all of those. All those. That's all in a matter of time. That's only been out twice now. It's had me about eight fish. About eight fish in two, two trips out and I had to stop using it halfway through one day because it still got bitten off. Now colour wise, um, a lot of people say colour makes a massive thing. I would definitely prefer a bird that I think works well because of its action and how deep it dives compared to the colour it has. I've, I've started using that one, white one. One of my best ever ones, I should have got that actually out of the garage and show you that where I've got a bright orange one with black stripes down it, it's absolutely in pieces. It's got tail all smashed off, it's on its fourth or fifth tail. Uh, the pox is being bitten out of it, it's been it that many times. That I'll just, I'll just have to reweight that one, but that's a really good colour, that bright orange's colour. Now, a lot of rivers and canals we fish are quite dirty, so your bright colours, your whites, your orange tails, your orange with orange tails, your bright greens, your fire tigers, all generally work well. Um, but I would always say, a good working bird will be a fantastic colour bird. Now, loads of people will probably argue about that, about colours. I've never been a massive fan and saying that colours are going to do stuff. And I know a lot of lads have caught a lot of fish on certain days on certain lures. If it want a blue lure, they won't take it. Well, it, a lot of it's to do with confidence. And I'm always confident I can take with me one squirrely bird 
one Cobbs Countdown and one Replicant and I know in, in any situation I will be able to catch fish on those three lures. Not because of the colours of them, but because I know what those three lures do and what they do in each situation and I match the lure to the situation, not the other way around. There's no point casting a Replicant round in three foot water, you're wasting your time. There's no point putting a squirrely bird like this in three foot water because you can be smacking bottom in, in milliseconds. But if you use something like a Cobbs Countdown in three foot water, it'll work. So it's picking the right lure for the right conditions on the right day. Now, right colours, um, we had a video not long ago, I think around Christmas time, where I had a 20 on a bright orange and yellow Cobbs Countdown on a bright sunny freezing cold morning uh, in, in, in crystal clear water, first cast. So it, 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 a lot of people say, oh, it's bright sunshine, we might should be really using glitter patterns and, and reflections at sun, it'll be all sparkling out like a bait fish does. Um, you know, I, I, I personally, I'm not sure on Paul's, what are your Paul's thoughts? No, I'm not fussed. Are you not fussed? No. Colours, no, it doesn't really make that fussed. much difference. And uh, on certain days, it might edge you a couple more fish than the other one. But we, you know, if we've if we've had a day where they're taking orange fire tiger, Paul switched to orange fire tiger, we'll both be catching. If that lure is running slightly different to the other one, it might not catch the same, same fish. If it's on a different side of the boat to the other one, it might not catch as many fish. Doesn't necessarily mean that lure's not going to work. And we've both proved several times where we've both been fishing lures completely different and both cast, catching consistently all day and it makes no difference whatsoever in our mind in our mind we're quite happy with what we do and that's what it does we've had a couple of questions in the one lad called sean what he's done is added weight to it and what he's saying it's doing it's turning and twisting over now that i'll tell you, there's two reasons what that can happen if you've put weight in the wrong chamber it can off balance the lure so you're pulling down it can push it off to one side and turn it over also if you've added too much weight generally if they do sink i've noticed a lot of them do turn over i've never actually seen a really good one that actually physically sinks i've seen the ones that slowly slowly sink but any that sink like a brick i've seen just just there's no point you might as well put a bulldog on so what the what it can potentially do if you want to drill it back out take a little bit more weight off and add the weight to the end of the shank of the hook what that'll do it'll, it'll try and straighten it out it'll keep it more more level because the weight is hanging further down rather than here because if you've got it wrong or you've put two another thing what does it if you put large balls inside there and they're on the side or, or they're off balance and that's what it'll do it'll keel it off to one side and then what that's going to do it's going to start rolling you don't want to run it rolls down to either side not a problem but if it starts rolling it's not going to work so you're going to either have to, have to take weight out put a smaller shot in or you're going to have to put a little bit of lead just around there well it's not lead we just use like um, electrician solder that one there works perfectly pulsing it running runs about 14 foot down works a treat that's the way to do them now one other thing is on retrieve speed um, my own personal preference if i'm fishing on a canal what I'll do, I'll cast it to the far bank and I'll get as close to that far bank as I can. Now canals are generally shaped, I don't know if you can see it that, can you see this? Are generally shaped in, in either a bowl shape or they've got like a shelf that comes down. So you want your bird, bang, to hit water on the far side and sit like that. That's how it's going to hit. Now pike 25 yards away, all the way around that are going to see that hitting water. They're going to see it's out there. Straight away they're going to see it and think, well what's that there? And what you're going to do, you're going to leave it a few seconds and then you're going to do a long, a long deep pull. What that's going to do, it's going to bring it towards you and it's going to make it sit down. And it's going to come down, maybe about three or four foot on its first twitch down and it's going to sit there. And if you've weighted it correctly, what it's going to do, it's going to turn back end up and it's slowly, slowly going to rise. This is the perfect bird. The perfect bird will then slowly, slowly rise. And you can actually sit there and watch your line in the water. We use quite, quite colourful braid. You can actually see your line in your water. You can't see a bird, but you, what you can see, you'll start to see a line slowly, slowly lifting. And then what will happen? Your tail will just come back up to the surface. Now, there's two trains of thought. You can do that all the way across. I know Paul like, really enjoys coming down and leaving it. Slack line, pull it down again and leaving it. I like to get mine down off the shelf and down quite quickly. So what I'll do, I'll do a long pull down and I'll do another long pull down and I'll leave it there and I'll leave it two or three seconds, start to come and then I'll do a slow retrieve every so often. So what that's gonna do, is because it's buying on back end compared to front end, what it's gonna do is kind of, they actually come in at this sort of an angle. So they go beat down and they'll come in like that and you'll see tail and you'll see them they'll slowly start to roll like that. 
that's how they generally come in some of them will come in a wider gape but most of the time it'll be a really subtle now a lot of the time a lot of the takes we get and, and i know that we had one at weekend where one one i don't know if it nailed this one nail this one uh no it won't. i just i put new tail on it no i had put this new tail on it so i took it out this weekend underneath boat got it down got it underneath boat we just sat slowly retrieving it it just started to rise like that bang pipe nails it round underneath boat perfect take sideways on in gulf lower fish hooked in, in boat really quickly now if you're fishing on the reservoir and you want it to get down deeper there's no point putting them large pauses in because all, all, all them large pauses are going to do is they're going to make it come up to the surface or, or not get it down as deep. On reservoirs, especially on trout reservoirs, anywhere that's like Chew or, or if you're going on Windermere or anywhere like that, any, any deeper waters, you want to get that down and in, in what we class the strike zone in the pike's face as long as possible. So you're going to cast it as far as you can. I mean as far as you can as well. They're not like cobs where you sometimes lose a little bit of... Um, you'll lose that little bit of contact at a long, long distance, like you do with some jerk baits, because the wider the glide at distance, the less control you've got over it. Good thing about birds is once of it, once of it, the fat as far as you're going to do, and you're in contact with it, you can feel it. So it's one swish down, wind it up. Don't let that slack line happen. Keep that line in contact all the time. Down, down, long pulls from even if it goes up in air, right down to right down to your feet big long pulls and it'll just bring it further and further and further down they're only going to get to a certain depth so they're only going to get to maybe 12 15 foot that's a maximum they're going to go down you're going to really rarely get one of these further down on that especially ones that rise to the surface and then what you do is it should come up directly underneath you straight towards you and you can either slowly slowly retrieve it up it'll then start to come head up towards the boat and do it that way there's nothing wrong with stopping and letting it pause because what it'll do it'll then tip up like that and go back up to the surface it's up to you. Fast pause, fast fast retrieves, so you can go twitch, 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 pause, twitch, 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 pause. Very there's not there's no set way of doing it. There's everybody will have their own little niches and their own ways of doing it. That's how we tend to fish ours. That's how I fish mine, Paul's uh, Paul, we've already discussed this. Paul Paul likes sometimes fast twitches. So twitch, 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 long pause, twitch, 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 or you can just do a twitch long pause twitch long pause but you know vary it change the change every single day this time of year when it's getting that little bit colder water's getting a, a bit more lethargic and they're not so much up for change uh, for chase keep it in the face as long as possible so long pauses let it come up really really steady down again let it come really really steady leave it there don't be scared about letting it go away to the surface and let it go back down again you'll be surprised how many times come up to the surface one twitch down and get smacked because the fish has been following it for quite a long way sits there waits for it comes back up to the surface one dive bang hits it straight away uh, another good thing about birds and if you do these right you can actually use them as surface lower if you cast out to the far bank now obviously it's gonna it's gonna sit like that so you, if, as soon as you start retrieving that, it's going gonna, it's gonna to actually start sinking. But if you can ring your rod tip up in the air and you lift it up in the air like that, you'll actually, wear, you'll actually see them and what they do is a tail just on the surface. And they actually really, it's actually a really attractive surface lower. Andy Scott told me about that and that really does work. They are a really nice surface lower. I think you've got a couple of fish on surface doing that way. I've got a couple of fish, so that works as well. Um, what else is another good way of using these? Um, trolling. We, we noted, I, I was speaking to a lad called Nigel Grasby who's, who's got quite a lot of pike on trout waters and um, he trolls them a lot. I've used them on boat before trolling and caught plenty of fish. Now what you can do, you can either troll them like normal, so you can cast off 25 yards by boat and you can just leave them out there. They'll troll about 7 to 9 foot I would say. I've never had one go much deeper than that. But what we tend to do now is if, we, if we've got a new water and we try to cover it as much of it as, you, as we can, we'll actually cast them out. Obviously I'm on tiller so I'm on, on, I've got my arm up like that. I'll cast it out, put it over, over my shoulder, cast 25 yards out and we'll just keep on swooping it like that. And what that's doing, it's getting it down anyway and it's making it dive and it's going either side. It's diving either side. Now I've had a lot of pike doing that. Paul's had a lot of pike doing that. That's a really, really good method. I know at one time on some of the big trout waters like Blithfield and places like that, that a lot of pike were accounted for doing that. I know Dice Grasby had a load of pike doing that. Definitely want to give a go. If you're going out on a boat somewhere and giving it a go, definitely worth a go. There's such a versatile lure. That's why we love them. You know, you can, uh, you know, I, between that, a Cobbs and Replicant to me are three of the absolute must 
lures you must have and I never ever go on any banks without those three lures. They're definitely up there amongst the top three. You can't go wrong.